Hi, this is Amy, and today I'm going to talk with Mike Lesgarden. He's a researcher who works at Tufts University. He studies microbiome um, pathogens and impact on a range of topics, including muscle mass. And so, Mike, um, hi, tell me a little bit more about your background. Hi, right. hey, Amy, good to see you again. So, right, I am a scientist at Tufts, and my work primarily focuses on, or actually my research, my funded research focuses on the role of the microbiome on muscle mass and function in older adults. But uh, I didn't start off on that road and had actually no interest in the mi microbiome 10 years ago, wasn't even thinking about microbes at all. So uh, I've kind of evolved towards that, um, that path. But then also on the side, I'm optim you know, uh, uh, interested in optimal fitness and health. So blood testing, dietary tracking, and then, uh, yeah, like, you know, the book, which is uh, also a side interest, which is, uh, you know, trying to educate the public about, um, you know, the role of microbes on our health beyond the gut microbiome and what we can do to optimize our own microbiome so that we could, uh, you know, delay aging and, and uh, live as long as possible because there's evidence, you know, as you know, that the microbiome impacts health and, and disease risk and aging and all that, so. Definitely. No, that's a good, that's fair, Mike. Yeah, I know you, I mean, we've been in contact for a while, but I do, I love, you have a book. That's one of the things you mentioned. It's called Microbial Burden. I love that title. I wish that that was my title in the sense that I, and I think we're going this direction when most people, I think the definition of what microbiome is really varies sometimes from person to person. There's, and it's fine. There's a certain sector of people who think that microbiome is sort of helpful organisms that always act in your favor and are kind of in like a kumbaya ecosystem and that they are usually, it's usually just that as opposed to the fact that mo under many conditions, those same organisms can actually act in ways that can drive disease processes. And so that's where I think our shared interests have lied in, wait, what happens when the microbes act in some against us <laughs> um, and that so that is the fact that the microbiome or the organisms the ecosystems of bacteria and viruses and fungi that interact in our bodies they can often um, especially under conditions of like inflammation and stuff act in ways that promote disease and so microbial burden sort of was a good term to refer to the fact that hey these microbes and viruses can become a burden um, under different conditions so yeah, yeah that was cool so yeah. in that book I mean give me a little is that how you see it yeah, it, originally I had it uh, labeled as infectious burden, but then mm. uh, I got some pushback, you know, from people. Actually, I wrote a paper first that had had that published because uh, there's there's this big drive to have uh, aging uh, classified as a disease because if you can get it classified as a disease, you can have an ICD code, you can get more funding for it. So nobody was talking about the other half of the human symbiont, which is microbes, right? So mm. I wrote a short paper talking about the role of microbes on age-related diseases and aging, and I called it infectious burden. So I got pushback from reviewers saying, you know, that, that suggests that, you know, your microbiome can infect mine. And so, oh, I, I guess. yeah, yeah. So, so then I changed it to microbial burden, which even that's a little bit, um, it doesn't really, ca it captures it, but it doesn't really capture it because, you know, that suggests like, you know, instead of having five pounds of microbes, you've got five and a half, but that's not really what I mean either, right? So I get that. Yeah, but you know, it's hard to encapsulate, you know, okay, having microbes and their products in places that they shouldn't be like the brain or the blood or placenta, wherever it may be, mm -hmm. that they're not supposed to be. How do you encapsulate that into a couple of words? So it's tough, right? So it is tough. Yeah, but I think it went in a good direction. I never thought about the like literal load of organisms, but that's fair. But yeah, 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 yeah. right. So speaking of that, then I think another thing that we're both interested in is, yeah, exactly when organisms are not in the gut and they get into the blood and tissue where, I mean, it's, I guess, somewhat up in the air. I can't tell. I mean, it seems like there may are probably organisms in tissue and blood in most people. It just depends on what's there. Um, but there's certainly more of a propensity for those organisms in tissue and blood to cause problems. So in your case, uh, tell me a little bit about the brain and the blood what your take is on those organisms. Yeah, so that's, to me, that's like the late stage, right? So if you've got, so there probably is a normal uh, blood and brain microbiome mm -hmm. that, so, you know, Janelle, Janelle Ayers, I don't know if I'm saying her name right, but she, yeah. uh, she basically, I don't know, I wish, I wouldn't say she coined the concept, concept but the, the idea of tolerance towards microbes, right? So, um, and I, I think I've watched her talk or read some of her papers where she talks about, you know, we need to develop 
we need to train our immune system to develop better tolerance. But I don't know that I like that because I'd argue that aging is basically um, an increased tolerance, allowing the microbes to live, you know, in more, uh, both more of them and in a different um, composition in the tissues that they're not supposed to be in, like blood and the brain. Okay. So, you know, um, you know, if you look at it as, as a function of there's too much of them in the brain and the blood, so that, that goes, that, that to me is the end point, right? The beginning of it is what happened, what led to that process, whether it's, uh, you know, uh, getting it through the, through, you know, the, the lungs, through the skin, through the gut, poor diet, whatever it may be. So, you know, I talked about that in the book. And then, mm -hmm. um, you know, the other part of it being the composition, why would the composition of the blood and brain and other tissue microbiomes change with age? And that too probably has to do with aging where, you know, the, the microbiome, wherever it may be, is going to have a composition that reflects the metabolism where it's normally found, right? So in the gut, it's going to change. So if you have a poor, a low fiber diet, you're going to have an overgrowth of bacteria that don't degrade fiber. Whereas if you eat a high fiber diet, you're going to have lots of fiber degrading bacteria, right? So uh, along those lines, you know, aging, you have cell metabolism, our own cell metabolism that changes with age. So then you have a different cell, uh, you have a different metabolism with age. So then you have a different microbiome with age. So it's both, both the burden going back to the burden of having more of them in the blood and the brain and all these other places, but then also the composition changing. And, exactly. but that's it, but even that, that's, that's the small part of it. You know, what really uh, excites me now about that process, like we talked a little bit about it through email about how uh, part of me has kind of moved on from this idea of, of talking and preaching to the world almost about it. Hmm. And I'm sure you went through this too, because like I said, you've been in this for way longer than I have where, you know, you're, yelling it to people and preaching it to people about microbiome and involved in this, 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 and that. And so many people don't know or aren't, edu aren't educated about it or don't care. But um, now with, you know, SARS-CoV-2, now people are freaked out. And it, to, the long story short is, uh, you know, more, now more people obviously are, know that microbes can, for lack of a better term, fuck us up quickly, right? So, <laughs> so, so for me to okay. say, hey, look, microbial burden, it's also an aging and age-related disease. I don't have to sell it anymore. So it's like part of me has seen my baby, well, not my baby, but the baby that, you know, I jumped into the game and decided to show the yeah. to them. Yeah, so part of me is like, all right, it, you know, the world isn't gonna be surprised about that now so much. So now, you know, a lot of what your interest is, is the intracellular pathogens. So that to me is now the golden question, you know, how, how can, you know, I'm assuming a, a big, so Cosmo had such a brilliant idea, it's amazing. And I, I hope it doesn't sound like I'm rambling, but. No. Uh, he, he, he basically, you know, he always plays connect dots, which I love because that's total, total scientist, right? But he said something about, I forget which one, but an intracellular pathogen turning off uh, beta galactosidase, potentially explaining the increase in senescent cells with age. And uh, this, this is so dramatic, you know, it's so dramatically understudied. And, you know, there is an increase in senescent cells with aging and people want to get rid of them. And I mean, sure, but that doesn't address the root of why are your cells infected? And then if you're getting rid of your cells and you can't make more of them, well, now you're at a disadvantage, which goes back to the tolerance issue, right? So we tolerate our senescent cells to, to limit them. But so anyway, uh, that's, that's I, I'm trying to, you know, get my brain more into the mechanistic of uh, how can we determine intracellular, intracellularly uh, infected cells and what can we do about it, you know, to, to further improve health and lifespan and all those things, so. Great. Yeah. Uh, no, that's awesome. You're correct that intracellular pathogens are some like my obsession to a point because that's what really made the possibility and now supported by an increasing body of evidence that pathogens and organisms in the body that can act as pathogens, which are some, I use, I like the term pathobiotic, Pathobiotic. which is yep. basically an uh, organism that can persist, it will be in a healthy person's microbiome and can be in a different person's microbiome and it depends on what it's doing. It's, I think that's what the key and that, that ties into intracellular infection is that, you know, there's been with microbiome in the early days, I think part of why people didn't follow me as much is I wasn't as interested in what's there. I mean, we can, two people can have the same bacterial species in the blood, but in one person, it might be expressing different, you know, it might be expressing different proteins, different metabolites, different, you know, 
different signaling molecules. It might be in a biofilm. It might then in a biofilm be expressing biofilm signaling molecules, quorum sensing. So what it's doing can differ. And that has been a challenge where people will say, for example, like HSV-1 or something, could that contribute to chronic disease? Mind? But lots of people have HSV-1. And it's like, I know, but it could be acting very differently or interacting with different organisms in the body of a person or acting differently based on the status of their immune system. So it really doesn't, like the past, because an early trend was, teams would say, oh, we found HSV-1 in these, in the control subjects that weren't sick and HSV-1 in people with a chronic inflammatory condition. And that would say it can't be doing something. And it's like, no, it's probably acting differently. So I think, and then that comes to intracellular infection. If you're a pathogen and you can infect a cell, a human cell, that I think that's just, that's like the, a field day. Then you can change. And that's what really got me into this topic. You can alter, if you can get to the nucleus of the cell, you can change that alter the expression, the human, you can alter how the human gene, gene expression changes in that cell. You can impact the epigenetic environment. You can impact all, you can basically hack the human cell in yeah. so many ways that there are so, when there's mysterious symptoms or inflammatory symptoms, then if you just take the number of organisms and pathogens capable of persisting in the body and the number of ways that they can impact human cell, transcription, translation, repair processes, epigenetic, you can combine that into so many symptoms that it really does begin to explain it. It's at least a basis for explaining a wide range of, you know, different pathological states. So it's, yeah. It seems like it seems like science is so far away from that road though. That's the disappointing part. What's interesting too, besides intracellular pathogens getting in and, and basically hijacking the cell. So that brings up like uh, Lena, I, I, she'll catch, I hope she's not gonna kill me for saying her last name, <laughs> Hernas, right? So, uh -huh. uh, you know, she, her work on Toxo, and yeah. uh, she's got a cell paper, right, where, where basically it's, you know, uh, Toxo is in competition with mitochondria for lipids. And it's like it basically, our cells basically end up at a standstill because it's like, okay, mitochondria want to use that for beta oxidation, but Toxo wants to also use that. So mm -hmm. it's like, all right, if we don't do anything, I mean, I'm, I'm characterizing it, but I, I'm not, I hope I'm not totally mischaracterizing it too. But yeah, once it's in the cell, it's like, it's like that, you know, arms race. Okay, I'm gonna take this, and if I take this, then you're gonna do this to myself. So, anyway, yeah. Um, but yeah, oh, yeah. So another thing that I'm uh, also trying to move past is not just who's there, because I think so much of science is focused on, you know, let's look at the microbiome, whether it's gut or skin. Where pick your pick your, you know, body orifice, right? Um, the composition of it. There's so much focus on that. It's obscene. Like hey, we have these microbes. And, you know, that goes to your point about mm -hmm. pathobionts, right? Like, just because they're there doesn't mean much. Like, what are they doing? And then, you know, these, some of these same studies will go and do, um, you know, metagenomics. So they'll say, all right, we had this gene expression. And I'm guilty of that myself. I published a paper talking about, you know, I had this composition and then I had, this was what the, um, the, uh, the gene expression profile was. So maybe that's what's going on. But there are so few studies that actually look at the end products, whether it's, you know, the, the fecal metabolome or other, you know, uh, metabolic products of, of microbes. And it's easier to do that for bacteria because viruses are basically, you're just looking for viral DNA or RNA, right? Or their, you know, their glycoproteins or, you know, stuff that's, because they're not really making stuff except for their own machinery, right? But right. that's microRNAs. But, you know, I, I'm kind of more interested now in the idea of, uh, of uh, you know, what, what are they doing? What are the, the products that we can measure? So it just goes beyond like, this is the composition. This is the composition in alcoholic fatty liver disease versus controls. Like, gives a shit. Like, tell me what, tell me what <laughs> products, tell me what products they're making that are actually negatively impacting it, right? Because again, like you said, it goes to this balance of, are they really bad because they're there, or are they making stuff that then is imposing bad stuff on us? So, that's kind of what I'm uh, going after in my um, a couple of my latest grants. So, um, you know, basically like high fiber diet, fiber fermentation. Um, that leads to, potentially leads to an increase in the short chain fatty acids. Short chain fatty acids have been shown to improve muscle mass and function in animal models, but who knows in old people, nobody's done it. Mm -hmm. But then what's interesting is that the short chain fatty acids, um, they can, they obviously they acidify the gut because they're acids, right? Fatty acids. So that gut acidification limits the growth of pathobionts like enterobacteria, which have genes to produce metabolites that have been shown to actually negatively impact muscle mass and function. So and there's a couple of grants that I've submitted that I'm waiting to hear back on, uh, you know, keep the fingers crossed. Uh, All right, fingers crossed, yeah. Um, I'm going after, like, I want to, are those metabolites that they produce beyond the composition, you know, um, 
so I'm more into the story of, you know, the metabolites, the, the bacteria metabolites, and, uh, you know, not just the good ones too, the bad ones, but even beyond that, like you can get, you can get into like bile acids that are produced by bacteria. How are they affecting, uh, you know, health? It's so understudied. So many people are, you know, focused on composition and not so much, you know, what are they doing? So. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I think starting with composition is the, where you start. I think it yeah. makes sense where first you do just need to know what's there. So you do that. That's fine. I think you're on the right track. But then, yeah, the proteins and metabolites expressed by organisms, that was like the second big moment for me where I realized, you know, like the capacity for organisms to cause disease because those, it's almost like the way I tell people in simple terms, I explain like, okay, you have the organism and it's almost like those are its weapons. So you have, that would be like the equivalent of you have the soldier, but then the proteins and metabolites that it creates as part of its life cycle or lifestyle are like it's weapons it's guns it's who knows yeah. it's nuclear bombs in some case because they can you know i think for example a good i'm trying to think of a good example of that there's a study i love where a team showed that proteins created by a family of viruses can directly bind into the human human insulin receptor yep. right yep. so there are mimics that are close enough in size and shape to human insulin like proteins yep. that they can bind into this human receptor that's supposed to control insulin signaling and at that point you realize like oh wow they can control the organism isn't even doing it the it's it's proteins and metabolites are interfering with you know human gene expression in a dramatic way yeah. so that yeah i know that's a that's a good direction so I, I think it's only a matter of time. The question is how long is it going to be 20 years or a hundred years or longer, but eventually, so not every, as you know, not every microbe can infect humans and adver adversely affect health and you know, disease and function and all that. Right. So um, it, it, eventually we're going to have the whole human symbiont mapped. Right. So depending on age, ethnicity, diet, whatever it may be, pick all the variables, you know, the cell type, Depending on the cell type, I'm guessing there's only going to be, you know, X amount, some vi amount of pathogens that can potentially affect it under, you know, like I said, all those conditions, age, activity levels, diet. And then once we know that, you can immunize against it or you can come up with targeted uh, antimicrobials or ways to boost, you know, cellular function, immune cell function or cellular function itself to fight those pathogens off so that we can better resist them and, you know, it's fun. like so many, yeah, that's why it goes back to, uh, you know, everybody, you know, these uh, scientists talking about classifying age, aging as a disease. And when you consider, like, like you said, how, you know, there are so many microbial mimics and we're just tapping the surface of how, how much are there, right? Like it, whether it's microRNAs or viral proteins, whatever it may be, but um, it, considering the vaccination and, and clean water and antibiotics, there was almost a doubling of human lifespan in the past hundred years or so. I wonder how much further lifespan will get pushed out once we've got all of the microbial triggers that adversely affect humans are mapped. And then, you know, you can just take some kind of a scan. I know it sounds like science fiction, but, you know, I don't know how it would be done. Like, how do you get an intracellular scan of some, right? And, what, and their microbial products instantaneously. Like, I, you know, it doesn't exist. For people watching us back 30 years from now, it doesn't exist right now, right? So. Yeah. But eventually it'll all be mapped and then we'll say, all right, you've got these intracellular microbes and I don't want to say pathogens, right? Because, you know, they can be whatever, but all right. And this is the, this is what we're going to do. And then they're not going to bother you and your cells are going to function optimally for the next 30, 40 years. Like, so I eagerly look forward to that day. I just wonder when it's going to be. I agree, Mike. I also wonder when it's going to be. I think yeah. Yeah, it's like, I agree with you. The topic is so understudied, which means there's so much potential. You know, we were, I, before you interviewed, um, and it was a written interview with Dharma Blashi. He's co-discovered HHV6 with Gallo back in the 80s. And I just, there, this was the most fascinating conversation. We we're talking about HHV6. HHV6 can, has been found in, in multiple sclerosis lesions in the brain. It's this, it's here, it, you know. And you think that there would be an HHV6 just like the way the human genome project, you know, like that level of like, like the HHV6 just, global project initiative this virus is, can be found in the brain it can infect neurons it can infect macrophage it can do this it's a, and it's no there's he mentioned about three teams that are studying hhv6 you know using good methods three to in the world right now yeah. and it's just crazy so i agree with you where the coronavirus covid19 i hope that that raises some awareness yeah. that by other viruses may also matter more than i mean you know I agree, like, 
with the coronavirus, one of the things that I've found helpful is that I've been saying forever, look, the same virus can drive many symptoms, depending on the cell it infects, depending on the state of the person's immune system at the time they're infected. Also, depending, and this is a variable that I don't see um, as often as I would like, whatever your microbiome and virome, which are viruses, ecosystems are at that time, when you are infected with a new pathogen, will determine to a large extent how that pathogen, what it can do. For example, with, I always give this example, the vaginal microbiome, all the organisms in the vagina. If someone has sex with someone and they're exposed to HIV, if the vaginal microbiome is in essentially better, you know, a better balanced ecosystem, they're less likely to actually acquire the HIV. And that's because those organisms are competitive and the HIV wants the niche, needs to get in there. And if there's you know, a robust ecosystem, it can't as well. So the same trend obviously flies, I'm sure for the coronavirus where what you know, what's going on in you at the time you're infected will also probably determine how much the virus can get into your lungs, get into your brain at the very least, right? So we have all those variables and you can see from the coronavirus, some people just get a classic case you know, lung issues, stuff like that. But then we're getting into, you know, stroke and blood clot issues, this, you know, Kawasaki disease tendencies, uh, neuroinflammatory processes. These are things that I have tried to point out in the past, especially the capacity the coronavirus does seem to be able to get into the central nervous system. It seems to be able to infect neurons. It seems to be able to modulate the metabolism of those neurons. And I have been saying that for so long, which is just because you can't find a pathogen in the blood, obviously, does not mean that it is not in the central nervous system and it, and it can drive these different symptoms in different people um and that's one of the things that i hope is a takeaway from this so that's you know all we can do is get the word out right there like you said there are so few teams that are studying hhv, HHV 6 right but you know mm -hmm. whether it takes three generations or four generations at least you know we'll have our video online and people mm -hmm. can watch it hopefully kids you know find it but on the purpose or by accident, maybe they'll have a school project and they'll see us talking about it and then get motivated to get in the game and start studying and become a warrior, you know, a science, a researcher warrior against, you know, this stuff. So, yeah, it's just a matter of time. It's just the question is how long, right? So, I agree. Uh, yeah. There's some positive developments. I think cancer immunotherapy is a great start. Now, I'm not sure that I think every team doing it under, look, views it the way I do. I think, and just to explain and, and your perspective I'm interested in, basically in simple terms, they'll engineer a patient's own T cells, which are important cells that target pathogens to attack the tumor. I personally think that that pat tumor probably has pathogens in it. There's yeah. really, especially lately, and I, I can throw up some links, studies that have identified a growing number. I mean, there's a tumor bacterial yeah. microbiome now, there's the viral landscape of tumors. So what I think happens is the T cells go after the pathogens in the tumor and that, you know, and it's basically allowing the immune system, giving it more strength to do what it couldn't do on its own before. And then there's some cytokine storm, which actually is kind of a battle between the activated immune system and the you know, tumor slash potential pathogens. And that makes the person feel worse for a while, but it's actually getting it root cause. And if the person can get through that, then we see that the outcomes from immunotherapy are way better than chemotherapy. That's exciting. I think we should be using that trend of supporting a person's immune system to better manage and keep pathogens in check. That is an excellent trend. I don't know. I 100% agree. The only drawback is it seems like all of medicine, all of the MD side of this equation is it, whether they're trained or they're short-sighted. And <laughs> part of, anyway, I have some negative words in my mind. I will say that, but I'm so sick of the mentality of cytokine storm, co coronavirus infection, cytokine storm. Let's get rid of the inflammation. Let's dampen the inflammation. Like, you're not treating the root of the problem. And so much of medicine is geared towards, let's treat the end of you know, the symptoms and not the root. And there's a huge defic deficiency in medicine and it's short-sighted and it sets us back. Now, can you have e efficacy in some people treating you know, cytokine storm or symptoms rather than the root? Yeah, for sure. But I mean, I can't believe, I can't believe the short-sightedness. Like the root of the problem is a weakened immune system. Like the yeah. cytokine storm is there in part, in a major part, as you know, to to, to signal to the body, make more immune cells. Come to this site, come to the site. There's a fight right here. Everybody come here now. All the immune cells come here now. So clearly the, the body can't make, the people who have cytokine storm, they can't make or their immune cells aren't as functional as they should be. So there's this over, right? So 
but that, like you said, with immunotherapy, it's I see that as such a small, a small, uh, you know, perspective in terms of that's what should be used rather than let's use the drugs. I mean, and then, and then what works against you know the immunotherapy uh, idea is you know okay dexamethasone, which is anti-inflammatory, uh, right? So there's some efficacy on improving outcomes related to um, you know coronavirus uh, um, survival, right? So that adds more fuel to the hey let's dampen the inflammation. But, and even in aging too, the story independent of microbes, um, you know, people are like, hey, let's get rid of the inf inflammation of aging without even considering, you know, where is it coming from? Why is it there? Like, what's the root of the problem? So I, I'm, I'm a root, you know, root person. And uh, yeah, we totally agree on that. Like immunotherapy is 100% the way to go, whether it's engineering new T cells, whether it's finding immuno uh, enhancing um, uh, capabilities, whether it's through drugs or uh, other nutrients, 100% there, but you know, that it, there is also in like, just to, using coronavirus as an example, um, in one study that I read, they use, uh, I think it's called thym thymosin, mm -hmm. which it, it boosts, I, I can't remember what it boosts. It may boost uh, CD8 cells, which are antiviral, but it doesn't work in everyone. I think it works, I wrote, I wrote a short blog about this. I can't remember all the details, but um, I think it work, works like in 40 to 60% of patients. So. Even that, it's not a perfect system. And then that's only one aspect of immunotherapy. You may, you may need broad spectrum immunotherapy. Just, just to beat that horse to death, there's a company called Regeneron who um, other companies are using convalescent sera and the antibody-based approach to treat uh, right, coronavirus patients. So I guess there are some companies or even uh, uh, scientific teams at universities that are using like a single antibody. And I guess Regeneron's approach is using a triple antibody approach. Like there's such a reductionist, uh, approach in science to, hey, let's give dexamethasone. It's one compound, but I mean, you can't. It's so impossible. But it's almost impossible to reduce our existence down to a single compound. It's got to be multifactorial in, in a in, you know spectrum of of stuff. So, um, so yeah. Yeah, I know exactly what you mean. I think it comes down to also stage of disease. It's just it's not well thought through that. And this, I think we share interest in. And this comes down to preventing aging or preventing another thing once you're interested in root cause and once that root cause can stem from organisms and pathogens prevention is the future i think yeah. we would agree in the sense that now let's say the cancer immunotherapy that i was talking about now patients will experience it can be a very severe cytokine storm syndrome because you have a, a fully developed tumor that's already in a place where it will kill you so to you know target that tumor potential tumor associated pathogens that is going to require a lot you know a big yeah. immune system battle my thing is what if we never let that tumor develop in the first place what if it, the first understanding that someone harbored certain, you know, even tumor associated viruses, Epstein Barr, you know, HPV, when we started to realize there'd be testing potentially to test whether that virus was acting, you know, not in a latent state, acting more, potentially expressing different proteins, doing something new, that would signal that we should actually begin at that stage before the person even has a tumor, really, to keep, you know, T some T cells, whatever, a vaccine, or just, you know, T cells that already recognize some of the pathogens that would would cause a tumor and there that you know cytokine storm would probably be minimal and we would just keep the process from ever really happening so that is where i think i got stuck in that early on i think you know i worked with a treatment called the marshall protocol it was doing that for different conditions that are not cancer we were using a drug that we were trying to activate the vitamin d nuclear receptor which controls a lot of um you know antimicrobial peptide the innate immune response like look if that receptor could work you know, could work better, the innate immune system would, Im the innate immune response would improve, then would the immune system on its own sort of wake up more and figure out that, wait, hold on, this person has herpes virus is acting up, hold on, the bacterial microbiome is not in good shape and kind of start to clean it up. And the interesting thing with that is in earlier cases, people, there were spouses of, for example, no, here's a good, my mom, this is, I, I'm proud, my mom thought it was cool, like, it's funny, my mom was like, this is really interesting. So she started to do it in a preventative fashion because she understood that concept. She started taking the drug we use to activate the vitamin D receptor and sometimes some pulse antibiotics. And she had a slight like growth on her neck uh, that was a tumor and it never developed. It's benign. Mm. She has no dental problem. Like, so she's, she's 76 right now. She cracks me up. She's so healthy. And I realize this is like an end of one thing, but see like, who knows? What if we did that? What if people 
you know, took care to keep their immune system in good shape and to keep that microbial burden you talk about down. And we wouldn't really have to get to a stage where you need a dramatic cytokine storm that has to be mitigated with dexamethasone. And the same trend goes for the coronavirus. What if we develop better treatments for early stage disease that when you're exposed, your immune system can better manage the virus at that point and you never get to that stage in the ICU where you're in a position where you have to be given dexamethasone. But we're, it, so we're at the, like, the cutting edge of science now with that though, because uh, say, so for example, so my fitness tracker, right, that I wear, mm -hmm. they, uh, they measure respiration rate and there's uh, some data showing that uh, up to three days before your infection or you you're become, I guess, PCR positive for it, that your respiration rate goes up significantly. Um, because your body's fighting it off before yes. you're, it makes it right. So, so, um, but then we're at the limit, like I said, we're at the limit of science because one, people have to care enough about their health and my gosh, most people don't care at all. So now we're back to this. All right. Most people don't care. They end up in the hospital. They've got, you know, some micro microbe associated or polymicrobial associated tumor. Now science has to go in with their reductionist approach and kill the cytokine storm and, you know, try all their, you know, all their, all the, therapies, right, without addressing the root of the problem, which is not taking care of it in the first place, right? So you let it develop over years, right? So, so we're at the limits of that. But um, now we get it to transgenerational ideas, because mm -hmm. there will be a small segment of, segment of the population who does care about that stuff now, whether it's small, okay, whatever. But eventually in time, that segment of the population will grow larger and larger. And then again, transgenerational, who knows how many generations it'll take. Eventually, that'll be the dominant idea in this Gattaca-like existence where I don't know if you've seen that movie. It's one of my favorite. Oh, movies. I love that movie. Yeah. Yeah, but where where you know now instead of being a small minority of people who are actively quantifying, all right, what's my CMV burden today, and you know based on my current lifestyle habits, when will my body be weak enough where it'll become a problem, right? So, um, it, however long that's going to take, you know, who knows? But it, again, uh, going back to this idea of we're on the limits of science now. CMV has been studied in terms of a vaccine for more than 40 years, and there isn't an efficacious CMV vaccine yet, right? So, you know, what if science is so, uh, you know, uh, green in its approach to whether it's CMV or something else, and okay, hey, you've got the CMV infection, right now it's latent, but we don't have a vaccine for it, and we don't have really any good therapies against it, so you're just going to have to live with it for the next 40 years, knowing that it may cause immunosenescence, which, you know, is associated with it. So, um, you know, I, I, I look forward to the day when science will have these things all mapped and, uh, you know, they're easy problems, but, you know, maybe I'll have to be in cryostasis and uh, <laughs> on a spaceship somewhere, on a spaceship somewhere going to like, uh, you know, one of uh, Ridley Scott's uh, planets. I don't know if you watched the alien movies. That, uh, no, I haven't, but no, yeah. my, I maybe mean, I should. Yeah, because, yeah. yeah, we'll see. I, no, I agree with you. I, do you know also feel a little get a little impatient because it's you know once you understand that pathogens can you know like we said impact the intracellular environment of the cells they infect you know alter human gene expression there's so this is the thing mike is there's so many teams doing good work on these topics and that's like part of with more of these discussions, I want to do that. I want to talk to those teams. The thing is they're disconnected. There's, there's one team that's studying, you know, P. gingivalis, which is an oral organism that, you know, can, is, is common in, on teeth and, you know, how that organism can get in the brain and contribute to potentially Alzheimer's symptoms. And then a different team that's studying a protein from that organism. So part of it is one of the things that I'm trying to do is can we bring together, and there's a couple of researchers I've talked to who are like, we need like, a group of growing people who understand this, you know, microbial viral, you know, paradigm um, in terms of chronic illness that can contribute to, and we need to be better sharing our our knowledge and ideas. And that's where I, I you know, just crazy. Where again with CMV, which is the site of there should be like the HHV six project that you know, just this should be there the way like there should be like a world war mentality just to say let's get let's study each one and what's it doing what's it capable of what tissues can it infect what cells what can it do yeah. if we did that which is we could do today it wouldn't i'm not even sure how long it would take to understand more so yeah it's yeah, a definite... couple, couple decades right maybe at most right. if that if you had that approach but unfortunately I, I i try to be pragmatic about how long that will take and uh so i so a uh, human lifespan has has uh since I think it's uh, two years per decade, there's been an increase of two years per decade since about 1840. 
which right, gets us to about 80 years of life expectancy now. So if you extrapolate using two year increase in life expectancy for every 10 years that pass, then the average lifespan will equal the maximal lifespan in about 200 years. So if most people know that they can't, and then you know, some people could say, and this may seem like a side tangent, but it's not. But uh, so some people would say, uh, you know, um, uh, what do I, what do I need to care about uh, microbes or any of this other stuff? Well, if if everybody's living to 120, and now you've hit this wall, now you need to go deeper into the subject. So then I think most people would start to care about aging and microbes because microbes can affect aging. And then maybe you get this, you know, this mass. Hey, we need this mass project. Like you know, when when a presidential candidate in the past would say, hey, we're going to go after cancer or Alzheimer's disease and have an Alzheimer's. I mean, yeah, these are, sure, these are diseases of aging, but the roots, right? So anyway, I think, I think unfortunately, it may be later rather than sooner, and it could take up to 200 years, uh, which isn't a, you know, a throw, thrown out of nowhere number, right? It's just extrapolation, but I wish it were earlier than that, but it may not be. Like, don't say 200 years. That's really long. I, yeah. I don't know. I see more hope that it could be sooner. I think some of the recent discoveries, um, you know, for example, Rob Moyer, who was a friend of mine was here at Harvard, unfortunately passed away from glioblastoma, which was devastating. His discovery that amyloid beta in the Alzheimer's brain seems to act as an antimicrobial peptide, that's one, that's to me, if that holds, one of the biggest paradigm shifts ever. Uh, if you can understand that. Yeah. yeah, I don't I don't think it's an if. I think it will. That's the thing. I, like, you, but here's the thing. That idea has been pitched for at least 20 to 30 years, like in terms of evidence in favor of that. So right. here we are. They're still the minority in terms of, hey, we've got plaques in the brain and you've got, you know, uh, consortiums and scientists writing papers like we need some kind of, like you said, a paradigm shift to start mm -hmm. looking at the microbial causes of Alzheimer's. And they're just, it isn't there, right? So um, so we're 20 to 30 years in and it's still not the dominant theme. So how many, how many more years, right? Unfortunately, yeah. I'm just trying to be. No, oh, there was a time I'm, when Alzheimer's journals would not publish. This was recently on ridiculous. infection. There was a group of scientists and you can see the paper that wrote a paper. I'll put their names on it, asking that infectious, you know, evidence yeah. be allowed to be published. That's how crazy it got where the community just wasn't open to the really obvious um, data that that was the case. So we've moved beyond that now. The Alzheimer's journals are actually publishing this stuff more. Yeah. Um, and I think there's a bit more open-mindedness, but I agree this kind of need for a paradigm shift in thinking is definitely holding things up where you have, you know, right now, medical textbooks still contend that the brain and the blood at least Sterile. are Sterile. Yeah, sterile. Sterile. Really sterile. And if you, you know, push against that, depending, you know, who's out there, who is looking at your paper, as you know, it's hard. So we have need this. And I do think that the younger generation of researchers is getting there. I was at a conference in Los Angeles, maybe, I don't know, eight months ago. And what was interesting is the main talks were kind of, you know, same old, same old. The posters were really interesting. There were a couple students who were doing organisms in the MS brain, this, whatever. And so I spent the whole time talking to the students just by the posters and yeah. there was there. And these students were, you don't blame them. They want to do some, actually do something new. And that is where the, you know, they are, they're not done. They realize that that is where the potential is. So there is hope there, Let's get them going. So yeah, I don't know. Um, I, I totally agree. I, I see yeah. it too. I see younger generation. I see more interest in younger people uh, in terms of microbes, for sure, 100%. But yeah. I, yeah, it just may take a long time, though, just to get the old geezers, to get the boomers and older out of the damn, uh, you know, uh, funding agencies and study study sections that, you know, don't... My first grant, actually, I pitched blood, blood microbiome, and it didn't get discussed at all. And, you know, one, one of the three reviewers was, was like, this is a... <laughs> I think I actually used the word par potential paradigm shifting idea that microbes are in the blood and you've got decreased gut barrier function so that there are microbes in the blood and that those negatively affect muscle mass and function. And then his group ends up publishing on the blood microbiome and aging. So, uh, so, but then, I, I mean, it's like, you know, it's like yelling into the wind on a mountain, you know, in Siberia that like so few people, right? So few people are, are you yeah. know, know about it, but uh, yeah, just, we just got to keep raising awareness. And that's why I did, wrote the book. And that's why you're out there doing what you do. So it's only a matter of time. Yeah, I think one of the things too is I think people get caught up in diagnosis a lot where it's like, okay, 
for example, I study the illness, chronic fatigue syndrome, myalgic encephalomyelitis is a much better term for it, ME. Some people still know it as chronic fatigue syndrome though, so I just connect those names because otherwise I get to a point where I'll talk to research teams now and they're like, oh, you want to study myalgic encephalomyelitis? That sounds interesting. There's this condition, chronic fatigue syndrome, that sounds boring. Like, it's the same illness. Okay, so yeah. that's why I say it, because I understand patients hate that name. It's a ridiculous name. It's a pretty devastating illness that seems to be neuroinflammatory in nature and just levels, essentially, young people in their prime most of the time. And just, and people end up bedridden. So in you have these cases where I think what has stalled the study of infection even in that illness, usually the illness usually begins with a viral infection. Okay, that seems like a big clue to me. But those infections are barely studied. So the research teams, and I'm just, people have been looking at the immune system only, the immune response, just that side of it. They've been looking at the human genome only, trying to dig, see if you just dig farther, you can find some gene that might show, you know, and it's not like the genome doesn't set the stage for stuff, but you know, there's not like the chronic fatigue syndrome gene that causes everything, right? And then, of course, the illness got accidentally moved into psychiatry, not accidentally, psychiatrists tried to take it over, where they tried to just literally say it was just you people yeah. manifesting their, so, yeah. and everything that we're studying in that field, except for a couple teams, is that, and not the infections that these patients sustain. And when you talk to a patient with the condition, the majority can say, well, First, uh, I got Epstein-Barr, I got mono, it never went away. Then after that, I was on a camping trip, I got bit by an insect, I don't know what happened, it might have been Borrelia. After that, I got food poisoning, I had a really bad problem there. And then after that, things got really bad. It's like, that, I think we should be studying those infections you sustained. And what has stopped that is this idea that, which is so incorrect at this point, if you just look at the literature, that those organisms that, they, that people acquire cannot persist, that somehow, even though Epstein-Barr virus, for example, is one of the most persistent viruses whose entire like, you know, gene expression is geared toward persistence, somehow in, in a lot of people's minds with this on this MECFS, you get an Epstein-Barr infection, that infection goes away, and then a new disease process starts, apparently, that doesn't involve that virus, which makes no sense to me. What we need to be studying, which I'm trying to study, I'm doing a couple studies on this, is what are those pathogens that people acquire? What I, do they clear? Probably not. Do they persist in the patient? And then what do they do that can contribute to symptoms? But there is a big mentality that has really killed that, which is that the idea that these organisms just can't persist. And that stems off the idea that if you do a blood test at Quest Diagnostics, and that organism doesn't show up on that, you don't have it. Whereas the organism very likely isn't in the blood where it's obviously going to be targeted by the immune system and killed. Right. It's probably in your tissue. It's probably yep. in the central nervous system. It's probably anywhere except obviously identifiable in an easy blood test. So that has been, that has really killed the study of infection is just this idea that if, a, if an organism matters in a disease, it has to be right there in the blood. So, so. yeah, I, I totally agree. That's uh that that definitely that brings us back to that's again the cutting edge of science like how can you detect yes. how can you easily detect intracellular pathogens i wish there was so part of me was thinking that uh um so if if there was a way i mean so say you do a tissue biopsy right like uh, whatever we pick your tissue and then um you know you see that your 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 whatever cells are infected with ebv now you've got some signature not in the cells but you know whether it's your immune cell signature there's got to be there's got to be a systemic signature that should be able to uh, reflect intracellular pathogens right because it's i mean it's going to be next to impossible right now to say all right your your you know your neurons are infected with uh, SARS-CoV-2 and your T cells are infected with X and maybe polymicrobial there's got to be some way of uh, having some kind of an easy to measure signature um beyond it being in the blood, like you said, because that's ridiculous. Um, yeah. I mean, I mean it might be, I, like with some of the, the studies I'm setting up, I'm doing with, with MECFS, we're gonna collect blood, cerebral spinal fluid. And then also I'm trying to get as many tissue samples from those patients through a number of ways. There's some surgical samples I'm getting, some other samples that I'm trying to get that are taken when, uh, for assessment of purple neuropathy that are basically just skin samples and just trying to get the genetic material out of there and see if there's any organisms, maybe even just stain um, with tissue. But you know, in the sense, I'm, we're gonna look in the blood because who knows? Yeah. But the problem that's happened before is other teams have looked in the blood, 
they didn't find anything obvious. And then their conclusion of the paper is there are no viruses in these yeah, patients. And ridiculous. the conclusion should be, we did not find them with our somewhat not so great, I'm not saying, you know, our tools in 2020, which are not perfect, you know, in any, any capacity to find them, we need to keep looking in other places. And whereas instead they'll just conclude, no, no DNA viruses, they don't matter. You know, and that's the problem is every study I think on organisms in human disease today should end by saying, and we just need to look further, you know, as opposed to yeah, like yeah. these, you know, kind of like doesn't matter anymore conclusions. So yeah, I don't know. To me, it makes perfect sense that we have microbes in our cells. It's just how, like, detecting them, right? But, and I, I can't believe that there'd be a significant amount of scientists that would disagree with that. That's just amazing. It's just amazing to me. Or I'm naive to think that microbes exist in cells, but I don't think so. Um, it's My a constant water. It's been that most a lot of scientists and MDs who aren't microbiologists, but are, yeah. you know, come from a different angle are taught that if infection matters in a condition, it's the infl inflammation that matters, right? So you have the, which is part of it. So you, let's say what they're looking for is if Epstein-Barr virus is contributing to a condition, then you should see an inflammatory response and antibody production and stuff. What they're not, what they, and no, what they think is that that's all that the virus can do is drive, you know, c cause the immune system to mount an inflammatory response, but they're not thinking about the fact that the virus can infect a human cell and they're changed, yeah, that, you know, transcript, transcription, yeah. translation, and that's, they're not taught that, I don't think, and that's where, like, you know, that's where you can really hack someone, is not at just that, that level. Yeah, yeah, not just that. What if you've got a, uh, a brain infection, right, and, you know, so it, now it's a matter of scale. How much how much of your brain needs to be infected where you've got, you know, a beta all over your brain, you've got brain inflammation everywhere. And then that brain inflammation spills out into the blood. So you can detect, you know, whether it's the tangles, inflammatory response, whatever. All right. Now it's easy to see, but how much, how much microbial, and it goes back to microbial burden, how much of the burden in your brain do you need? Right. It's, it's, it's a spectrum, right? So will a little bit cause chronic fatigue? Will a little bit more cause neuronal cell death, and now you've got, you know, whether it's increased risk of Parkinson's or Alzheimer's disease, will even more, you know, cause who knows what. So, um, but yeah, it goes back to the limits of, of detecting intracellular uh, pathogens, you know, and just like you said, using, you know, things like trying to find them in the blood, which again is nonsensical because, but then even that, I bet, like I said, I bet if you've got brain infection at whatever level, you know, your immune cells in the blood aren't stupid. They're going to in some way have some kind of, you know, uh, whether it's a slightly altered transcriptional profile or, or, or even worse. I mean, it's going to reflect somewhere, you know, even, even, you know, whether it's having more senescent cells, I, I don't know. So, um, I agree. There's a team in Stanford, a couple of teams that are doing TCR seq really well. So they're looking at T cells and basically can, you know, sequence the, in simple terms, the, you know, the part of the cell that's, you know, uniquely responding to a certain pathogenic threat. And then you can say this T cell seems to be responding to X pathogen or, you know, so there one team, it's a Tony Weiss Corey, they did a study of Alzheimer's cerebral spinal fluid. And I think two of the T cell, you know, clones that they were looking at were responding to Epstein-Barr virus in the cerebral spinal fluid, which that's fascinating. So yeah. I don't think they actually looked for the virus, but the, there's a good chance that they might not have found the virus because the vi that this is another trend is, low biomass, and what I mean by that, I think you know, is yeah. these organisms, when they're causing chronic disease and they stick around, very few, little of the organism has to be around to cause big problems, as long as it, again, can infect that cell and change yeah. the way human, the human genes are acting, right? So for example, in Lyme disease, Borrelia, uh, there seems to be so few Borrelia organisms can stick around in a person and drive an inflammatory response dysregulation to a point where that one of the things would literally be like you could take a blood sample from someone and they had just not even enough organism it could be in the blood and that sample just you know so so we have very few you know like low biomass can cause a lot of problems a good example of that is is p gingivalis that organism the oral microbe i mentioned on a tooth when cat when teeth and the microbiome virum on teeth like trend towards periodontitis P. gingivalis will usually drive that process by starting to just, you know, express virulence factors and quorum sensing that, that create more, like the other organisms around it start to like, it pushes them towards also acting in a pathogenic fashion. But P. gingivalis can be present as 0.01% of that oral biofilm, right? When it does that. So if you're looking just at like, what level is this? You wouldn't even 
you would just scout yeah. it, right? But it's what it's doing is huge. So we have yeah. to, that's another reason to go back to activity. Want to say like, what's it doing right? And if we could, again, if we could figure out, yes, it, there's this certain immune response or something. So yeah, the way I look at it is you look for the organism, you look for its proteins and metabolites. That's some other clues if you can find those. And then you try to see if you can figure out what the immune system might be doing and see if you can correlate that. I don't yeah. know. Yeah, good plan. And then <laughs> spread the word so that we can get more, you know, people yeah. in the game and people in the fight because more hands on deck, better, you know, quicker, faster results. So yeah, totally. Yeah. Well, that's cool. So then you're going to do that. You're doing with muscle metabol. You're going to look at metabolites with muscle. Yeah. So um, it's basically feeding older adults a super high soluble fiber diet, and then you know potentially you know can diet can that diet impact their their muscle health? So I don't know. We'll see how it gets scored. I mean, uh, you know, even even uh, I already got pushback at the uh, at Tufts. They were like, why don't you just do like resistant starch or something? And I mean, even that. So total reductionist like uh yeah you know. hmm. but yeah. i'm gonna it's it'd be triple so it's basically almost a mic diet where most people eat you know soluble fiber is fermented by gut bacteria right insoluble fiber is what bulks the stool and and you poop it out but gut bacteria don't ferment it at all so um it's basically triple or more what the standard american diet is and that's not even like a western diet that's just older adults you know typical whatever diet they eat it's like six to eight grams at most of soluble fiber a day the diet I'm proposing is, uh, you know, tw around 25 grams a day. So, you know, I'd expect that would supercharge. Uh, and then I'm, I'm working, uh, I'm trying to work out all the details on building a diet like that in mice and then doing a short mouse study to see, because it's funny because, uh, you know, if I, I have preliminary data because, you know, that's how these grants, you know, right. So, but uh, uh, if I had more data in mice, so say I feed older mice this high soluble fiber diet and not just like, okay, I gave them x amount of resistant starch or x amount of you know uh inulin or fructooligosaccharides which is completely non-physiological like inulin and fructooligosaccharides are found in things like garlic uh onions to get to get that much no no animals eating so much garlic that they're going to get 10 grams of <laughs> so I, it's just impossible so um you know so anyway i i'm i'm planning on i'm trying to work out all the details uh to get the, uh, the diet made because what animals, what animals usually eat, they basically eat a relatively low soluble fiber diet. But in so many of these animal studies, they compare the, you know, a chow diet, which has like wheat, corn and other stuff, soybean, which is relatively low in soluble fiber compared to vegetables. Vegetables are king for soluble fiber. So, um, it's going to be a very high vegetable diet. And then, uh, yeah, let's see if it can impact muscle mass and function. And then if there is a change in muscle mass and function, I'm going to give them antibiotics. And then that would basically say, oh, it was a microbiome effect. So, um, yes, yeah. I get it. so let's hope, let's hope, uh, yeah. got to get that off the ground. And, and, and then I'm battling against, you know, do the universities close and research gets shut down still because uh, coronavirus in the fall. So I've got to do it, you know, on the quick, quick and dirty so that, uh, yeah. That is definitely a struggle myself as well. I'm kind of getting to a point with some projects where I need patients to come in for samples. And it's hard if they're, you know, very susceptible to viral infection to know if that's okay. So that's, so yeah, I'm going to stay the flux with that as well. But I'm in the same boat. Like my, those grants that I'm talking about would probably start like uh, early next year. Mm -hmm. If this, this, if this stuff is still going on, like, like you said, I'm trying to recruit people that are 70, 75, 80, they're not, will they want to come in? I mean, I, I had to budget. I didn't, I wouldn't say I had to, but I put in my budget an extra 20 grand for like taxi or Uber or some kind of thing to get them from their house to the thing, because who's going to want to take public transportation, right? I mean, no, nobody's going to really want to smart, do that. Mike. That's really well, smart, Mike. That's really smart. I would probably hope. do the same. That's something to think about because yeah, I can't blame patients. Like I'm bringing in patients with uh, MECFS, that condition again, that usually starts or is sustained by a viral infection. The last thing that can happen is that someone gets the coronavirus when I'm trying to do, you know, collect samples. So I have, yeah. but, you know, I'm here and by Mass General, that's where we do the collection and they are amazing in terms of, I mean, everyone is being incredibly careful. I'm not overly worried really, but at the same time, I do realize it's a big deal. So yes, you know, that yeah. coronavirus definitely threw a you know, wrench and yeah. stuff, but I've, you know, what I've been doing is just even conceptualizing, I'm just getting every, like the RB applications ready, the grant application, you know, like everything just ready to go so that when it's, you know, more safe for patients yeah. to come back in, you can just hit the ground. That's my, that's what I've been doing. 
yeah. So there could be a vaccine uh, by the end of the year, but I'm not sure that it'll work in older people. Like we'll have to see, right? So I don't know. The vaccines have interesting. You know, I don't know the mRNA vaccines and stuff are new to me. I don't know how those really are gonna. You know, it's cool to see new va development, but I don't know how it's gonna play out. It's uh, yeah, I, really at this point, it's hard for me to totally predict how this is going. It's uh. Yeah. So I guess we'll see. But, somebody's yeah. so, somebody's got to be successful. There are like more than 100 vaccine trials. There's got to be one or two. I mean, I hope. Yeah, but then I even not, right? I mean, HIV, 40 years, no vaccine. So right, CMV? Like saying, CMV, like we've yeah. been trying. You know, I, so I don't know. I, yeah, we'll find out. Yeah. But I do hope, you know, again, even with the vaccine development, I hope it just, again, spurs the idea that we really like, why is it so hard to do a vaccine? We should have been studying this before. We should have been studying viruses more. We should have been creating better antivirals. We, and I, if there's any benefit from this, those would be some of the things, which is like, why were we unprepared? And that part of it is straight up because we don't study viruses well enough. We don't, yeah. there's just not enough going on. So maybe, you know, one, Thing would be that this would increase that awareness. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, there's a company that I follow pretty closely that is making that mRNA vaccine, Moderna, and they've also they're also working on uh, uh, a CMV vaccine. So, um, you know, there's a part of me, you know, maybe it's in a couple of years where let's go after some of the other, whether it's the you know HHVs, right, and go after the vaccines for that and see how that affects because you know the data on a uh, you know anti herpes medication and Alzheimer's incidence and all that and dementia. So, I mean, it maybe it. it Maybe there's an awakening you know, over the next decade. Yeah, and that's now. the thing, Mike, is also, you know, it's interesting when it comes down to just, for example, the anti -herp you know, the herpes antivirals. That's one thing is there are existing drugs that we're not even using for yeah. chronic disease. I mean, there's a paper that came out recently. I think it's called Therapeutic Options in Alzheimer's or whatever, and it was allowed. I'll post a link later. They go into just, you know, existing drugs that or supplements that it's not maybe it's not gonna annihilate the herpes virus or other organisms, but there are compounds that have activity against these organisms. We don't use any of those, as you know, in any cases. So we could today start from a better place where there can, you know, and there are, you know, protocols that doctors use and stuff, but they're all just sidelined from, you know regular you know you go to a doctor you have to kind of get into like a niche side mode to start doing those you know antiviral antimicrobial protocols but that's where the action is quite frankly yeah, totally um, and it's not hard to you know innovate and bring some of those in now so there's some hope you know we could get on a better track today depending on the focus and what people are interested in so i'm doing i'm doing all kinds of like i don't know i think interesting stuff like uh, so there are some studies that uh look at like molecular docking uh um, so it's basically looking at the uh, kinetics of, of, of uh, the spike protein binding to the ACE receptor and then, you know, which uh, compounds or metabolites can inhibit that process because if you inhibit the spike from binding to cells and it get, doesn't get into cells and it isn't going to make more of itself, so potentially, you know, you ameliorate the disease. So there are natural compounds that using, well, it's, it's an in silico approach. It isn't in cells, right? But there's so little data on, on compounds and, you know, well, aside from things like rem remdesivir and you know, stuff like that, but I'm talking about stuff in the diet so that I don't have to go to my doctor and take, you know, some, you know, something that's going to adversely affect me. But uh, I even wrote a little blog post to have a video on uh, hesperidin, which is in uh, things like peppermint and, um, you know, blood oranges. I don't know if I can get enough of it, but hesperidin was one of the metabolites that's been shown to have a, uh, a high uh, inhibit, a potential inhibitory rate on the, on the, uh, on some of the viral replica replication proteins. So I'm trying things like that. Whether or not it'll work, I don't know. But now my mind is open too for uh, things like flu infection. So I got the flu. So like I, I, we talked about this a little bit. So, you know, I got a flu vaccine, even though that's 50, you know around 50% efficacious. I got the flu shot in uh, December of this year. And still in February, like something hit me hard. And, you know, I told you my daughter, she lost her sense of uh, taste and smell. And I didn't even think about Corona at the time. So what's interesting is that, uh, even though I went for the antibody test, you know, IgG for uh, SARS-CoV-2 and it came up negative, I think it's possible now that the antibodies that I had just faded away. There's a paper that was published that the uh, antibodies may not last, so there may not be protective immunity, right? So, um, yeah, Mike, as you know, we, I got sick, my boyfriend at the exact same time, I think, which suggests that maybe the coronavirus was in Boston. Again, I was also told it was impossible. I hadn't traveled. This was the last days of February, early March. But I was never able to get tested, uh, you know, at the time.
but I haven't even done antibody testing because uh -huh. I looked into it. I was like, it doesn't seem yeah that great. I can't, I'm waiting. I, it became a part-time job. We try to get figure out how to get tested or initially I was like, I can't do this anymore. So now I wonder if we had it, but I, again, um, also, like you say, do I even have the antibodies? I, there are so many variables that I'm not sure. So again, we just, I have this open question of, you know, whether, which I kind of hope we would in terms of that would help for our vaccine development and stuff. If yeah. but, but that brings me back to this idea of potentially uh, plant compounds that could, you know, just adding into the diet, whether you can get enough from diet, you need to take it super physiological, though, I don't know, but you know, so I, I got some kind of infection this year and I'm assuming it was flu, right? And then two years ago, I got some kind of, I, I get the flu occasionally. Like I didn't, <laughs> what's even more interesting is that the year I didn't get a flu shot, I didn't get any kind of infection and kids in school are getting sick like crazy so that my daughter is constantly having something in, in, in the, in the fall or not fall, fall slash winter. So, but anyway, now my mind is open to look for, you know, these studies like this, that even though there aren't, you know, RCTs that actually look at, all right, can hesperidin actually, you know, people who take it or eat foods high in it, do they, are they less able to get coronavirus? Those studies don't exist. They may never exist. Like for, to have RCTs for the role of diet, but uh, is rare if ever. Um, so, um, but now my mind is open. So next flu season, I'm going to try a whole bunch of stuff. And just in line with that thinking, in line with that th thought process, I suffer in a, from seasonal allergies. And when I say suffer, I mean, uh, if you want to take a look at like my face now, my eyes like that. And the reason I did that is because I gave a, a talk, a presentation last July in, in New York and sneezing, puffy eyes, inflammation. I know I had inflammation because, you know, I get my blood tested like six times a year. My CRP was about double what it normally is in a non, you know, June, July. So I said, it's grass and, and pollen. It kills me every year. So three years in a row, I have data. Like now I have blood data. So now I'm on the case. Now, now it's like, I'm not fucking around. Those are the exact words. So my eosinophils, so are usually around 40 to 50. But in June of the last three years, they go to 160, they triple to quadruple. So I have now a signature of what goes on, which makes sense. It's a histamine response, right? So, so I thought, all right, I'm going to try some stuff this year and see what I can do. And this goes into the whole thought of what can you do when you've got some kind of inflammatory uh, response or you're battling some kind of infection. So uh, I was like, all right, I'm going to prepare myself better this year. Let's see what kind of dent I can make in eosinophils and symptoms and all that. And it's, I ha not only do I have the blood test data now because I track my uh, resting heart rate, my resting heart rate goes up in, term, in, in periods of infection, which is pretty well established in the literature. So in February, when I uh, had whatever that infection was, my resting heart rate is up. It was, it was at its lowest level ever in January and then was up two beats per minute in February, which is if I look at you know T-test this month versus my February month, higher resting heart rate, my body was fighting something obviously. Anyway, so that same pattern happened last June. So now I have resting heart rate and actually heart rate variability, another cardiovascular metric for last June. I don't have it before then. And I've got blood test data so that when I looked at it this year, I was like, all right, I'm going to try X, Y, and Z. So I bought a HEPA air filter and I basically carry it around me everywhere. Like if, if, <laughs> I was, if I was still at Tufts, like if Tufts was open, I'd have the air filter there uh, in my office. So I sleep right next to it. I keep it right next to me the whole time and it filters out pollen and everything else. All right. So that's one. Then, um, uh, what else did I do? Anyway, that may be the thing. I, I don't know. Some well, things you're like basically just doing a personalized medicine, which I think is the future, which is what's happening to me. Yeah. Yes, data from randomized controlled trials or RCTs is valuable, but I think there's an over obsession with RCTs. I mean, there's, yes, it's a form of evidence. It's strong. It's great when there's an RCT, but certainly just because there isn't an RCT doesn't mean that something doesn't work. I, I mean, yeah. just and also there are certain things that are not well tested in RCTs. And overall also an RCT costs so much money to conduct that it's unlikely we're going to conduct a perfect RCT on every compound that could be valuable in yeah. any kind of infectious or other state. So I am definitely, I, you know, I take certain supplements and things, but I do the same thing where I just, you know, will try exactly if I have an infection, take something that's like, you know, different, see how I fare. I think it's pretty normal to do that. You know, I'm just, for example, with COVID, I'm just interested in, in, in zinc. I mean, there's some basic stuff, right? So there's a paper that showed that intracellular zinc, if it gets inside the cell, you know, lung cell, that that can inactivate part of how the virus replicates. And that's fairly simple. Okay, if there's even a small chance that that's the case, 
um, I'm going to take some zinc. That I've been, yeah. And also there's compounds, for example, the zinc needs to get into the cell. Um, so it needs what's called an ionophore, which is a channel, because usually zinc will not naturally get in, go inside the cell on its own. So it kind of needs like a little channel to open up so the zinc can go in. That ionophore channel, so you need to take a compound that's an ionophore. Well, you see GC and green tea, ah. zinc ionophore, I don't know. Quercetin is a zinc ionophore, which is already in a supplement I take, just kind of a daily antioxidant thing. So I've just been taking that, drinking some green tea with some zinc. I mean, I don't see the downside so much. Yeah. Um, I think there is a little bit intracellular zinc if you go too far, can increase fungal growth. So I don't want to, but just I'm taking like a little zinc and like that, you know, I don't know. Um, so some stuff like that where, you know, and I got frustrated because with the, with COVID, there really is not, there people aren't looking into that. like the stuff earlier on that you might be able to do it's kind of been very icu focused of like this blockbuster drug might help someone as opposed to like the same trend with chronic disease like what can you do early on to tinker with some stuff so that you might be in better shape so yeah, yeah i think that even the zinc is just a, an example of a fairly easy to get and somewhat safe compound that you know you can use it's just um, a matter of, it's just a matter of scale like i i track my diet so i know how much zinc i take in every day and it's just like, I don't know if I want to supplement above that. So, yeah, but. no, I'm not a, I mean, I'm not a doctor, by the way, but I'm not a fan of high dose stuff. Like I, yeah. I worry you can override your body's own feedback pathways and stuff that, but well thought out, you know, whatever, a little more zinc, a little bit there. Yeah. So I, don't know, I, I think that the, that kind of research is valuable. I would diet. I also eat a pretty targeted diet. I've been eating keto though lately. I don't know just trying it. I just, which I can't tell if it's helping me or not. Have you ever tried keto? In terms of like what, cutting out, cut, just carbs, right? I mean, and going carbs, sugar. I, just no carbs so, and sugar. So I'm a, I, I shouldn't say recovering junk foodaholic. I'm basically mm -hmm. a junk foodaholic where if I eat a little bit of junk, well, I can, if I don't eat junk at all, which is basically quote unquote carbs, but is stereotypically referred to yeah. as carbs, right? Because pizza is carbs and donuts are carbs, but I don't look at those things as carbs. That's junk food. So if I eat any of that stuff, because I go completely abstinent and don't eat it, I can kind of manage to only have a little without going crazy. Because if I eat enough of it, if I have one donut more than two, or you know, you know, two donuts instead of one, my uh, competitive eater DNA kicks in, and it's like a whole box of donuts, a half a gallon of ice cream, a whole pizza, like a, you know, Domino's big giant cookie. Like I can't, I can't. So. But when I eat just regular food, like not, not keto, you know, just, uh, but I have, because I track all my stuff, like I, I'm playing with my fat intake, which a big part of keto is a high fat diet, right? So yeah, it I'm, is high fat. But, that's what it ends up being. I, I got interested in it because um, even when I was undergrad at Georgetown, I was already studying in the lab how a ketogenic diet can decrease seizure incidence. So there were already families we were working with where they had a child that went from almost 200 seizures a day to none on a wow. ketogenic diet. Yeah. Why, right? Um, and now there's actually ketos helping patients with Alzheimer's with epilepsy still, Parkinson's. There's a researcher, Chris Palmer, here at uh, Harvard, who is, he has, oh no, that's schizophrenia, sorry. He has some patients with schizophrenia on ketogenic and they are in full remission, which is incredible. But if they even eat one piece of pizza, Mike, it's, it's over. So it, it would no, be a modulation yeah. of, of some metabolism. And the question is why? And I actually wrote a paper. I think I have some ideas into why. And I think it ties to, guess what, microbiome. So I'm about to submit a paper for a publication that goes into that. So I'll, I'll share with you after. Nice. But I think it can impact how pathogens are able to modulate host cell metabolism in order to replicate. The only issue I have with keto is that it's generally, I mean, so the most, the biggest bonus is getting rid of the junk, not necessarily quote unquote yeah. carbs, but we didn't evolve. Like, like, you know, the junk food is, is a few, and even bread, I look at bread as junk food because you're taking basically a whole food, the wheat, and then you're grinding it and milling it and taking the fiber out and adding sugar to it. This is, I mean, we, Monkeys in the jungle are not eating bread. Tigers aren't eating bread, right? So this is, our genes aren't well adapted to that. So there's actually a Michael Rose, he's a big Drosophila guy. He's been studying it for, you know, the genetics and longevity of it for decades. And um, he actually found that if you gave flies a diet that was closer to their evolutionary diet, they live longer than on the standard lab diet of molasses, or whatever sugar source they have. So 
figuring out that like that goes back to the individuality find whether it's keto for you or whether it's the diet for me what I, that what i go through you got to find the diet that you're best adapted to but um so yeah, yeah it's funny I too agree. actually i actually i actually uh so in early in june when my allergies were killing me like and i get to the point where i can't breathe at night and then if i can't breathe at night my sleep is terrible if my sleep is terrible i feel like complete dog shit the next day and and this, and this is for months, like it, it, it was ju June and July of last year, two full months, like not two weeks. So, um, but yeah, just trying, trying different things and, and, you know, trying to, but most people don't do that until it's too late. And then you're at the doctor. So I actually emailed my doctor. I was like, uh, you know, I'm suffering right now. What can you do? So, you know, he, he said, Hey, I can get you, which I, I expected him to say, Hey, I'll get you this you know, anti-inflammatory. And I don't want the treatment, which goes back to what we were saying earlier. I don't want the treatment of the symptom. So I immediately said, hey, what about allergen immunotherapy? There is, there is some, there are a few studies on, uh, you know, where you give basically grass and, and, and pollen and yeah. inject it over a few. So I, I, I'm thinking about trying that next year, but I may not have to because basically the pollen kicked my ass this year for only about two weeks. My resting heart rate went up for about two weeks. And, and, it, it, and I see it actually, like, it's really interesting how it just killed my cardiovascular metrics for only about two weeks. And since then, I mean, I'm back to pretty much normal yeah. physiologically. So whatever I'm doing, it's I've after three years of it kicking my at least three years. I can go back probably decades. This thing has kicked my. I remember going on spring break in college and suffering from the grass around me, like I'm not even thinking what is this about. Like now, yeah. obviously, I know, but but yeah, most people don't do that. It's till, until it's too late. So fair, yeah. You should look into NAET. It's a type of acupuncture. I'll tell you later. So you, I've done okay. that with certain uh, allergies. I used to have more food stuff. And then they, it's kind of like, they, yeah, they do the acupuncture for, it's like that idea of a little bit of exposure. It's basically exposure therapy, but it's a type of acupuncture. Oh. oh, oh. Yeah, I don't know. I can tell you more after. But yeah, that's some stuff I've done. I don't know, but I agree. I'm definitely, I don't know. I just have a exploratory mindset, whether it's research or myself. Um, yeah, I've gotten some pushback for experimenting on myself you know, I think, you know, in my case that when I was, well, basically 20, I got sick with MCFS, the illness that I most try to study now. And so everything, I'm much better now. Everything that I did was me just experimenting on myself. So I wouldn't, I would be bedridden if I hadn't experimented on myself. That's how I was. And so, you know, there's some pushback to say, again, we go to these randomized controlled trials and stuff. Well, yes, I agree. That is a strong source of evidence. But if there isn't a randomized controlled trial yeah. that, you know, self. offers a medicine for your, for your particular symptom, I understand why people, you know, experiment because that's what I did and I was able to help myself. So, yeah, I don't know. It's the, tricky, the tricky thing the tricky thing is though like if you get to a certain age and then you're trying to do those experiments i mean if it doesn't work then you may just die that's the tricky thing that and that's one of the reasons why i want to get all this data on on myself now so that i've got decades of it so when i do get to 80 90 100 and beyond i can i can know my own physiology and basically have it mapped yeah so that i can know what to do so yeah maybe i should test my blood more yeah yeah, yeah. well cool well good mike then yes. i guess we'll just we could stop talking for now. We could probably talk forever, but yeah. um, no, it's good to talk. I think like overall, just, you know, we both want root cause, Yes. more study on organisms, more study on pathogens. Um, you know, if you have any last words. <laughs> it's all good. Good talk. Any, any time. Yeah, exactly. We're basically really close to each other. Just yeah, that too. Virus and stuff is kind of an issue, but who knows? All right, cool, Mike. Thanks for your time and we'll be in touch. See you. Right. Take care. Bye. Bye.